All right, thank you everyone for joining this month's, uh, this month's seminar on the ice giant systems. Today we have with us Dr. Dan Shim. Uh, just a few things before we get started. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that if you want to follow uh, future meetings or sign up for our listserv, I'll go ahead and drop, drop that into the chat in a moment. Um, let's see. Uh, so we'll have our presentation and then we'll have some discussion time after. Uh, and Dr. Shim has said, if you have questions, uh, you can ask during the seminar. I'll go ahead and monitor the chat um, and uh, ask those questions in the middle or at the end. Uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, and I'll go ahead and in introduce him. Dr. Dan Shim is currently a Navratsky Professor of Materials Research at Arizona State University's School of Earth and Space Exploration. Uh, and he studies the physical and chemical properties of materials under high pressure and temperature conditions of planetary interiors. His research, research focuses on understanding how such properties affect the structure and evolution of Earth and planetary interiors. He obtained his PhD in geosciences from Princeton University and worked as a Miller Research Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. Before joining Arizona State University, he served as an assistant and associate professor at MIT until 2012. Uh, so without further ado, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, introduce our recent uh, research results to this group. Um, I like to, to uh, uh, thank the, um, the opportunity to, um, uh, to uh, Dr. Burtis and uh, Kensick about uh, uh, today's um, opportunity. So um, I'm a chemist, I'm a mineral physicist, and um, I use this high pressure experiment on materials, planetary materials to understand the um, evolution structure and composition of the planets. Today, I want to talk about um, some um, work we have been do uh, doing for understanding how hydrogen interacts with other planetary materials and how it can help us to better understand the, um, the internal structure of Uranus, Neptune, and a somewhat of um, sub-Neptune exoplanets as well. Um, so, uh, I want to start with the um, internal structure of um, our gas, uh, our ice giants. Um, uh, our ice giants has been modeled uh, uh, initially with the um, differentiated material, uh, uh, differentiated materials. So at the center you have a uh, rocky core and overlain by thick um, water-rich layer, and um, and with the um, hydrogen-rich atmosphere. More recent models prefer the um, compositional gradient, uh, potentially mixing between these materials under high pressure and high temperature conditions. Um, these model models are particularly useful because they are able to uh, explain some of the um, limited but existing observations. For example, um, the extremely cold hydrogen rich atmosphere of Uranus has been well explained by uh, hypothesized compositional gradient in these planets. Um, there's also an important uh, ambiguity in our understanding of the composition of these planets. Uh, gravitational data is really important to constrain the internal structure and potentially composition of planets, as we have seen well for the um, Juno mission and how how much impact we have seen for the um, advancing our understanding of the in, in, internal uh, composition and structure of Jupiter. Um, the data seems to be a lot more limited for Uranus and Neptune. Um, um, the study that I'm showing in the slide tested the, um, the two different models. One is to mix hydrogen and the um, then rock, which is represented as a um, SiO2 in this uh, figure, and the other is hydrogen and water, which is more of a conventional uh, idea about the composition of these planets. In fact, for the interior, as highlighted by this black box, um, the data for, uh, that, 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 that you simulate with the equation of state of rock and hydrogen matches fairly well with the level that you can match with hydrogen and water. 
So just by looking at the gravitational data, we still have some level of ambiguity in our understanding of composition of Uranus and also Neptune. Um, outside of the solar system, there are also a, a large number of planets that are uh, similar in terms of mass radius relations with Uranus and Neptune. Um, this diagram shows mass radius relations of some of the exoplanets documented in the literature. Um, the, the group called sub-Neptunes are highlighted uh, uh, here, and um, they, their mass radius relations lie above the, um, the curve that, is, that represents Earth-like composition, silic mainly silicate with some amount of metallic iron. And um, they have a mass radius relations actually lower than the um, Uranus and Neptune. And if you include this group here, that reaches to the level of Uranus and Neptune. So the interesting question to ask, uh, an important question to ask about these planets is what are the compositions of these planets? Um, if you use their mass and radius measurements, you can equally well explain their mass radius uh, relations by taking a model that includes hydrogen and a rocky core and the um, water and rocky core. So you have an ambiguity whether outermost envelope of these planets are whether, uh, 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 whether water rich or hydrogen rich. Yet um, they're different from our um, ice giants in a sense that they're very close to their hosting stars. Um, that has a, 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 a very important implications for how these planets, sub Neptune exoplanets, would evolve with time. In fact, um, um, we have sufficiently large number of uh, sub Neptune exoplanets discovered and documented in the literature, and um, that we can actually un, uh, extract more information about these planets by looking at their demographics, which is shown on the um, right hand side of mass radius diagram in this slide. Again, I'm highlighting the sub Neptune groups. And if you look at this slide, um, there's also a, a large number of planets just below the um, sub Neptune group. And their uh, mass radius relations follow the um, what is expected for Earth-like composition, which means that uh, 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 dominantly silicate with some amount of uh, um, metallic iron with very thin atmosphere. If you look at the histogram between the um, sub-Neptune groups and super-Earth group, there is an interesting uh, 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 decrease in the frequency of discovered uh, exoplanets at around 1.7 Earth radius, which is now called um, radius gap. Um, what has been interesting and important over the years, in, in recent years, is that the models that assume hydrogen-rich atmosphere for the sub-Neptunes um, uh, have been successfully explained this radius gap by uh, incorporating the um, uh, massive atmosphere loss, hydrogen rich atmosphere through photo evaporations or the um, heat from the, um, the interior or the core. So this um, um, appears to indicate that the, uh, many of these sub Neptunes are hydrogen rich. Um, or hydrogen has hydrogen uh, hydrogen rich atmosphere, um, and if you actually look at, uh, look at the literature, um, there, you often find that the um, there's a there's a, a sentence that that caution you that the um, the mini Neptune or sub Neptune commonly used for these planets uh, may be misleading in the sense that uh, these planets may not necessarily be the um, the miniaturized version of our ice giants such as Uranus and Neptune if we assume that they are water rich. However, uh, some uh, high resolution case studies uh, uh, for the uh, mass and radius relations uh, shows that at least some subset of the sub-Neptunes are better explained by water and rocky core rather than hydrogen and rocky core. Um, this raises an interesting question about how these planets form, because now you should be able to deliver a lot of water into the, um, the, uh, the, the area that is very close to the host hosting stars where this close uh, in, in transiting um, sub-Neptune uh, exists. 
or uh, you probably need to have a, uh, if you prefer, if you prefer to form um, this water rich planets outside of the snow line, just like potentially uh, our solar system, you might have to find a way to bring this uh, a, a planet that is formed farther away from the stars into current locations. So this is an important problem to, 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 to think about. Um, related to our um, ice giants like Uranus and Neptune, I wanna raise two uh, important questions today and I wanna try to uh, address those questions through um, uh, high pressure chemical experiments. Uh, first question is, are hydrogen rich and water rich sub-Neptune exoplanets that I briefly review here are really from different formation processes or they're from separate origins? Or are there any way that they can actually form through a, a, a related or even a common uh, physical or chemical processes? Second question that I wanna ask is how then, you know, our ice giants fit into this sort of scheme or model that explains the sub-Neptune's composition and the um, evolution. So I wanna talk about two chemical processes today. I wanna to talk mostly about the, um, the chemical, relate, uh, chemical reactions that potentially relates the um, water uh, and hydrogen as shown by the first line. And if I do have a time in the later, uh, I'm, I'm gonna briefly talk about the uh, mixing and demixing um, uh, processes of some planetary materials involving hydrogen and water and how it could influence our uh, understanding on internal structure of Uranus and Neptune and sub and Neptune exoplanets. So to be able to carry out the um, chemistry or chemical experiment, now you need to have uh, uh, some well-defined pressure and temperature conditions because pressure and temperature uh, fundamentally uh, changes the um, uh, behavior of materials as we well learned from uh, studying Earth interior. So I'm gonna start with the, um, the rocky core and, and, and hydrogen rich atmosphere uh, sub-Neptune model. So um, uh, sub-Neptune, if uh, it is uh, entirely explained, the mass radius uh, relations of the sub-Neptune is entirely uh, explained by pure, hyd pure hydrogen or a hydrogen-rich atmosphere, then you can calculate the, um, the pressure conditions from the mass radius relations that ranges between 0.1 to 10 gigapascals of a pressure. And it, uh, this thick hydrogen atmosphere have an enough of an insulating effect that the theoretical study have shown that the, um, the rocky core will maintain a molten uh, um, state for billions of years uh, that translate to the um, temperature range of about 2000 Kelvin or higher at the interface between magma ocean and hydrogen atmosphere. With that, we can design a high pressure experiment. Um, the tool that I use a lot is called diamond anvil cell, where we use two gem quality diamonds and then we sandwich sample, which is represented by this green foil at the center. And then we squeeze them with diamond anvil. Uh, to be able to understand hydrogen and planetary material interaction, you wanna inject hydrogen. In fact, uh, at ASU, we have a capability to uh, compress hydrogen gas uh, to uh, 1,500 uh, um, bars of pressure. And we can also uh, mix hydrogen with helium or other noble gases. But today I'm gonna focus on pure hydrogen experiment. And this uh, blue area is, uh, blue area represents the um, hydrogen. So we can immerse materials into the um, hydrogen. What is nice about using diamond as an anvil material is that the, um, uh, it's transparent to a wide range of electromagnetic uh, 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 um, uh, wave ranges. So we can bring in uh, infrared laser and focus them to the, um, the sample immersed in the hydrogen and we can melt the silicate and metal samples. At the same time, if we conduct this experiment at uh, uh, synchrotron facilities where uh, intense X-ray beam is available, we can monitor the um, type of chemical reactions and materials formed during the chemical reactions. Yet there is an important problem of uh, uh, dealing with hydrogen in this experiment. 
because hydrogen is the lightest and smallest element in the periodic table, as you all know. And it's so small and so diffusive that it try to find any way to move along the pressure, pressure gradient and escape from the pressure uh, 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 chamber. So if you compress hydrogen, it's well known in our high pressure community that they start to diffuse into the diamond. And when they diffuse into the diamond, they go in between carbon atoms and make the diamond uh, structure extremely brittle. And the problem becomes even more severe if you try to laser heat samples inside the hydrogen medium to the melting temperature, which requires heating of 2,000 to 3,000, even 4,000, 5,000 kelvins of uh, temperature depends on the pressure range. Um, so these are micro photographs of the sample inside the diamond anvil cell looking down through the axial direction. So this is a gasket material which forms the, um, the, the, the sample chamber. This little foil you can see is the sample. In our case, it's olivine. And this chamber is filled with hydrogen. So this seemingly transparent area are filled with hydrogen. And uh, the, 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 if you look at the, um, this micro uh, photograph, you can see this black bend uh, sitting at the side of the, uh, uh, the sample chamber that is hydrogen-induced fracture in the diamond anvil that is being developed during the experiment. And if you look at the middle picture, you can see that it is uh, not focused. It's not because we want to blur the image, but because it is being damaged and slowly uh, split uh, uh, under high pressure because of the hydrogen effect. You can, in fact, see very sharp fracture going through the sample. And you will ultimately break or shatter diamonds in this way, which ultimately fails the experiment. And this normally happens during the experiment. And, you know, uh, we cannot really collect any meaningful data. So uh, the, the important experimental challenge that we need to solve to be able to study hydrogen under very high temperature conditions is to prevent this type of experimental problem. And um, in fact, uh, 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 many people in our high pressure community have worked on this problem uh, in the last decades, and they found a very interesting solutions, which we adopt into our experiment, which is to heat hydrogen bearing sample for very short period of time, like microsecond range. That allows us to prevent hydrogen to have enough time to diffuse into the diamond so that we can protect the diamond and reduce the possibility of fail um, during the laser heating. And by accumulating or repeating this process for uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of times, we can uh, do heating more than a total of one second or more. With this, we recently have published a paper on our first experiment using MGFBO, iron magnesium oxide, immersed in the hydrogen and heated above the um, uh, partial melting of this material. Um, Right-hand side of the, the slide, I'm showing X-ray diffraction. Those who are not familiar with this type of technique, what you see here, the, particularly the peaks, are measured at the um, particular uh, uh, interatomic planar distance. So this interatomic planar distance and peak positions are characteristic to certain uh, materials. Um, and in fact, if we know the crystal structure of these materials, which is the case for our experiment, you can compute their peak locations expected at given pressure and temperature conditions, which you can see at the bottom of this uh, diffraction pattern as a uh, vertical bars. Um, we start with MgFe uh, uh, oxide with hydrogen with different amount of iron in this case to the conditions where these materials are known to undergo partial melting. After the heating, we find that iron hydrogen alloy forms, which means that we reduce Fe2 plus in this structure and turn them into iron uh, metal and then alloy with hydrogen. And then we also uh, identify the um, peaks from MgOH2, which is magnesium hydroxide. What that means is that magnesium oxide remains to uh, remains um, oxidate, uh, oxidized uh, state, unlike iron, which reduces 
based on our uh, X-ray diffraction experiment, uh, X-ray diffraction evidence. And then this MGO left over after the reaction uh, um, um, somehow get hydrated uh, uh, with water. So somehow the water forms. In, if, in fact, if you write out this uh, observations and chemically balance the um, before and after chemical reactions, um, you will find that the um, that hydrogen and MgFeO reaction produce iron hydrogen alloy, MgO left as an oxide. And then because you reduce the um, iron two plus into iron metal, um, that allows some amount of oxygen get released to the um, hydrogen atmosphere that ultimately reacts with hydrogen and form water. So this is a natural, uh, the water formation is a natural consequence of this chemical reactions. In fact, um, uh, uh, by several authors in previous years for more than decades, uh, uh, it has been pointed out that the um, uh, reduction of iron uh, oxide by hydrogen can produce water. And the idea has been applied to the, um, um, uh, 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 for the range of uh, planets from Earth-sized planets to the um, uh, some degrees of Neptune. Yet studies often find that the way, uh, the, the, the reaction that, that you make here isn't really going to produce a lot of water required for uh, explaining some of the sub-Neptunes out there um, uh, if they are water rich. The reason is that in the planetary formation, during planet formation, um, a lot of iron is already in me metal form. So to be able to uh, really take advantage of this chemical reaction, you need to have oxidized iron, which is actually a fraction of iron in the system. So the iron, oxidized iron availability would limit the amount of water that can be produced through this process. And the second thing that was overlooked by these studies is that in fact, uh, uh, iron that forms through this reaction or iron metal forms through, through this reaction will alloy with hydrogen and therefore a lot of hydrogen can be consumed through this um, uh, alloy formation at the same time water is formed. Um, the next question we uh, 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 like to address we through our experiment is to study the um, minerals that has silicon in it. So magnesium iron, uh, magnesium silicon and iron are the major cations of rocky part of the planets. So this one can view this as a more realistic case. So we use olivin as a uh, magnesium uh, uh, silicate uh, proxy mixed with hydrogen the same way we did for MGFeO mixed with hydrogen experiment. Now you're looking at again X-ray diffraction patterns. Um, the peak positions indicates what phases are formed. The bottom ticks shows the um, uh, theoretically calculated peak position of uh, different phases. After chemical reaction of the um, olivine and hydrogen, we find that MgO uh, uh, appears in the diffraction pattern. Again, we didn't start with MgO. We start with MgFeS2, SiO4. So somehow this material breaks down, all of it breaks down and form MgO. And we find the um, iron hydrogen uh, alloy indicated by blue arrows, uh, the same way that the, uh, we observe for MgFO, which means that iron two plus, again, reduced uh, uh, to iron metal. Now, more interestingly, in this experiment, differ from the um, MgFeO experiment, we find iron silicon alloy indicated by this red lines or red arrows, meaning that now silicon also undergoes reduction from SI4 plus to SI metal and alloy with um, iron. We conducted similar experiment with very iron rich um, sample, which is called Fairlite, which is essentially Fe2SiO4, uh, for that case, we observe essentially the same results, which is the formation of iron, iron hydride, and uh, reduced silicon to metal. So if you write this observation into chemical reaction, 
our experiment indicates that olivin breaks down in hydrogen into MgO and all the iron in the olivin now reduce to iron metal and alloy with iron hydride, uh, 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 reduce an alloy with hydrogen to form iron hydrogen alloy. And then uh, silicon also get reduced and alloy with the um, metallic iron. And because now you are reducing both silicon and iron, you can actually produce a lot or release a lot more oxygen from olivine that ultimately reacts with hydrogen and form water. Do we have a direct evidence of the um, water? Yes, I'm gonna show you in this slide. Um, we recover the sample and then we look at under the um, um, scanning um, electron microscopy, which is the image here. You can see uh, these two areas uh, um, uh, showing some uh, distinct texture uh, compared to other part of the sample. By the way, this broken sample is the olivin. Once that was in the single foil, uh, the, the, the foil breaks when hydrogen escaped from the chamber because this is uh, uh, taken at, after the recovery of the sample to one bar. Uh, here I'm showing schematic diagram of how laser heating can be conducted. Laser heating is local heating which means that only a small part of the sample is being heated and get reacted with hydrogen. So the advantage here is that you can have a fresh sample left over together with a, a reacted area. Uh, if you look at the reacted area, you can recognize the um, uh, spheres at the center of the um, heated area. In fact, that sphere, this is a zoom in view of this particular heating spot is actually metallic iron alloy with silicon and hydrogen. Well, hydrogen doesn't stay in iron alloy when you quench to one bar. So uh, hydrogen escapes from this metal sphere and leaves this little uh, 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 holes. Uh, these, these are nano uh, uh, meter size holes on the surface of the um, iron sphere. So in, in some sense, uh, you're looking at the um, formation of metallic core in a micro scale uh, in this experiment. And, and they, they actually um, integrated and, and uh, collected together in a liquid state and formed this type of sphere because of the surface tension. And the surrounding area that you can see sort of loose powder is leftover oxide after losing silicon to the metal. Um, now, uh, for this sample, we are able to conduct the um, uh, 2D scanning of Raman uh, scattering, which allows us to measure the um, OH vibration of the um, water. This blue area is the area where we detected the um, strong OH vibration signal, which is mainly from the surrounding area. So we have a direct evidence of formation of water. So uh, to summarize this um, uh, experimental observation, I'm putting this electron microscopy image of the heated area back, but this is sort of from the angle, not from top down view, so that you can actually appreciate more of what happened during the um, extreme uh, melting event of silicate and metal, uh, silicate uh, under hydrogen um, uh, atmosphere, or in this case, hydrogen liquid, because pressure, above 5 GPA makes um, hydrogen into liquid state. You can see again the um, uh, metal sphere at the center uh, with a little bit of a, a, a holes you can see uh, at the top of the sample surrounded by uh, mostly oxide that lost the um, silicon and oxygen. Silicon went into the uh, metallic iron and oxygen get released to the um, hydrogen and form water. To summarize all this into the chemical reactions, uh, we find that iron oxidized iron react with hydrogen and form iron metal with a water. And um, silicon oxide or silica reacts also with hydrogen and reduce to metal and form H2O. What is important to, to uh, note here is that because silicon is oxidized to four plus while iron is oxidized to two plus, um, when silicon reduced to metal, it produced twice more water. And then if you combine the fact that much of the um, uh, iron is already reduced form in uh, uh, planet forming systems, 
and silicon is already in mostly oxidized conditions, uh, silicon reduction should be able to produce much more water than the iron. Um, one important additional important observation that I want to highlight is the fact that iron also reacts with hydrogen and form iron hydrogen alloy, which allows for the um, large amount of hydrogen ingassing into the deep interior if this reaction happens in the planetary scale. So uh, I will uh, 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 sort of uh, show you some cartoons what type of, uh, where and how this reaction may happen in the planetary scale. So this blue area shows hydrogen atmosphere uh, and this uh, brown area shows the um, silicate magma ocean. So this assumes the um, hydrogen rich version of uh, sub-Neptunes. Um, and um, at the interface between atmosphere and the um, magma, you will uh, develop a reaction between hydrogen and the um, silicate magma that will crystallize um, uh, or they will form iron silicon hydrogen alloy liquid and then uh, alter the um, magma from silicate uh, to oxide. And at the same time, water will form and that water can be incorporated to both atmosphere and the um, interior. And the recent experiment has shown that the, um, some hydrogen can be actually uh, dissolved physically into the magma and reach to the deeper interior, which means that the, um, even inside the silic uh, silicate magma ocean, hydrogen may uh, go into that and then uh, trigger this type of reaction as well. And this type of reaction may also happen during a uh, planet formation stage of these planets because incoming silicate may be ablated in the um, atmosphere and then uh, trigger this type of reaction. So um, uh, just to demonstrate uh, what type of impact this reaction could have for the planetary scale, I will uh, 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 um, uh, uh, bring up a very simple case. So this pie chart shows the uh, mass uh, uh, percentage of iron and magnesium silicate in Earth-like core situation. And this roughly matches the, um, the mass, uh, mass ratios of metallic core and silicate uh, mantle of the, uh, the Earth-like planets. And if you add 3% of hydrogen there, you have enough hydrogen that reduced all the silicon in the magnesium silicate, and that will uh, reduce the size of the mantle or a refractory part of the core. And then uh, uh, much of the um, silicon moves into the metallic part of the core. And then the atmosphere becomes uh, uh, much more heavier because of the released oxygen that reacts with hydrogen to form water. In other words, this reaction can produce a larger uh, amount of water and the growth of metallic uh, part and shrink of the, um, the rocky part of the core is a, a natural consequence of this reaction. And what is important here as well is that the magma now converts from silicate to oxide by losing a silicon. So again, if you put this into the context of a little bit of an animation here, if you initially had a, um, a, a, a conditions where your uh, a rocky core is surrounded by large amount of hydrogen in the initial stage, uh, the, the, the molten state of the magma and hydrogen will react each other and the water forms. If somehow dynamics allows this reaction to continue until the end, you have a possibility of converting hydrogen rich planets into water rich planets. And this reaction can potentially link hydrogen rich version of planets into the um, water rich uh, planets. Well, I'm so far talking about reaction in the molten state of silicate. We also conducted an experiment on the, um, the, the, the solid state of silicate. Um, I'm gonna just be brief and uh, um, uh, show you the results. The results we obtained is that silicon reduction is much more efficient in a, a liquid state. In other words, if silicate is in solid state or the temperature of the planet is low or cool down enough, this reaction may be stopped or uh, at least become really sluggish. 
uh, so that the conversion from hydrogen to, to, to water-rich planet will become uh, quite inefficient. So uh, uh, the, the thermal history of the planets will be very important in, the, in, in this type of idea. Now, we also carry out more experiment recent uh, days by adding carbon into the system because Uranus, Neptune, and possibly sub-Neptunes contain some amount of carbon in the form of methane um, in the ice layer. So we want to include carbon into the system. And we also want to uh, add pre-existing water into the system to see how the reaction changes. Again, to avoid the complicated uh, uh, experimental results descriptions, I'm going to go to the um, summary of this uh, 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 experiment, experimental results. We find that carbon crystallizes as a diamond uh, as low as 6 GPA. That's really, really low pressure if you think about Uranus and Neptune. So um, carbon may not remain in the water layer. And in fact, it'll crystallize into the diamond from very shallow depth, which makes the chemistry much simpler because now you have to mostly worry about hydrogen and water. And we find that the, um, as, uh, uh, by using different uh, pre, uh, uh, prescribed ratio between hydrogen and water, we find that the, um, the silicon reduction stop happening at particular hydrogen water ratio which means that the, um, the, the chemical balance or chemical equilibrium between hydrogen and water will be very important to uh, a model where this conversion will stop and, uh, uh, and the, um, the, the planet uh, structure is more or less uh, 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 remain constant afterwards. Yet what I want to also emphasize is that if you have an excess hydrogen, much more hydrogen than the rock, then you will have, uh, 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 you will dilute the um, water into the system and allowing the um, a more extensive conversion from hydrogen rich version to the water rich version uh, for those type of planets. So, but what I wanna emphasize here is that the, um, in this picture, if you take into account this chemical reactions, uh, it is probably very difficult to maintain pure hydrogen version of, uh, of planets. In fact, coexistence of hydrogen and water is an inevitable because of this chemical reaction. So um, uh, what does it imply to the um, Uranus and Neptune in our solar system? How we can actually uh, apply this knowledge into the um, Uranus and Neptune uh, uh, in our solar system? Well, I show that the, um, the uh, in initially hydrogen-rich uh, version of the planets can uh, uh, produce water uh, endogenically without rely, uh, rely on the water delivery into the interior. And the uh, hydrogen and water coexistence is probably the natural consequence of this type of chemical reaction. And um, some of the model for Uranus and Neptune indicates coexistence of hydrogen and water, um, a thick uh, water envelope. On top of it, we have hydrogen rich atmosphere. Are they related? The question is then, you know, uh, uh, Uranus Neptune is really different from sub Neptune, or uh, uh, Uranus and sub Neptune is perhaps an a, a intermediate stage planet that stops at certain point from hydrogen-rich version to, to water-rich version. So there are a lot of interesting questions to, to ask for the Uranus and Neptune in this framework. And this highlights the importance of having accurate gravitational field measurements for the Uranus and Neptune. And that probably help us to, 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 to uh, understand Uranus and Neptune's past together with this laboratory experiment. And that exercise will potentially allow us to, to better understand the um, um, sub-Neptune type exoplanets out there as well. So uh, for the, um, the, the given time that I have about five minutes, I'm gonna talk briefly about mixing and demixing. So far, I present the, um, the materials uh, uh, from the perspective of a very simplified picture of materials. 
And I admit that I didn't include um, uh, one very important aspects of these materials, which is mixing and demixing. And I actually treated materials as if they don't mix with each other as much, which is not the case. I took that uh, approach just to simplify the, um, the, the, the arguments. Um, now, uh, recently we study how much hydrogen can be mixed or alloyed with iron. It's been well known that the um, hydrogen and iron alloys very well under high pressure. By the way, hydrogen doesn't alloy with iron at one bar. So it's pressure triggered process. Recently, we were able to uh, uh, melt iron in the um, uh, in hydrogen um, medium, and we find that approximately twice more hydrogen can alloy with iron when iron is in molten uh, uh, um, conditions, which means that the molten uh, in, in interior of the, um, the, the, uh, the 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 ice giants or hydrogen-rich planets may have a large capacity to store hydrogen in it. We also study the um, potential mixing between water and olivine, and we published the results uh, a couple of years ago in Nature Astronomy. Uh, basically, to summarize, we find that the uh, when olivine is mixed with water and then laser heated and for melting, we find that the uh, magnesium dissolve into the water and mixed with water, while silica, uh, remains as mostly solid phase, which means that the um, if you have water and silica in the deep interior of ice giants, you'll have uh, some degree of chemical mixing um, between rock and water. Hydrogen and water mixing uh, possibility has been explored, yet uh, 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 there are some uh, discrepancies that we need to work on. But in general, there are good evidence that hydrogen and water will be mixed um, at certain pressure, uh, at certain high temperature and high pressure conditions. We don't exactly know where it begins to form a complete sort of mixing state, but that would be very exciting and important for understanding the internal structure of uh, ice giants and, and sub-Neptune type planets. So think about so if you take into account this mixing, demixing ideas into the model of the interior of a ice giants that has rock, water, and hydrogen rich atmosphere, they may not be differentiated like what is shown here as conventional model assumes. The chemistry probably allows them to mix and naturally develop the, um, the chemical or compositional gradient into the interior. Um, in that case, uh, the, the, the natural, uh, the, 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 the compositional gradient is probably natural consequence of planet formation of this material um, and, and large availability of volatiles like hydrogen and water into the system. And the, um, this chemical uh, uh, state will uh, support the idea of supporting this compositional gradient for uh, billions of times scale. And in fact, I want to also mention that the um, recent Juno mission for Jupiter has shown that the um, Jupiter itself, although this is gas giant, not ice giant, contains this compositional gradient reaching roughly uh, to the um, half of the, the, the radius of the Jupiter. Um, again, I want to uh, uh, end my talk showing one interesting example of why understanding Uranus's uh, and, and Neptune's interior is so much important for understanding a range of planets out there in the um, extrasolar system. Uh, some of the model argue that the, um, the, um, the, the uh, uh, super Earth, some subset of them at least, form through massive gas loss uh, 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 of sub-Neptunes. So after uh, gas loss, some sub-Neptune may convert into uh, a super Earth that has very little atmosphere. If you take our chemi uh, this chemical reaction that I discussed today, through this uh, in uh, the, the, the chemical reactions, much of the hydrogen will be in gas to the interior of these planets when it converts into the uh, water-rich version, such as hydrogen, or hydrogen as an anion, 
or hydrogen as a molecule or hydrogen as a water form. If you lose this ocean somehow because of the distance from the stars, and then you cool the planet enough after a certain period of time, now you, your insulation is gone. This planet will solidify, which means that the solid mineral phases doesn't have an enough capacity to hold on to these volatiles, which was once dissolved a lot because the interior was in molten state. Then this uh, reduced solubility of these volatiles perhaps could uh, allow these volatiles to go out and potentially form the atmosphere. How does the um, Uranus and Neptune uh, uh, internal structure fit into the, um, this, this, this uh, hypothesis? Well, if they are really related to the scheme of a hydrogen uh, rich planet converting into ice uh, or water rich planets, they might represent some sort of intermediate state between these two end members. So potentially help us to better understand uh, even habitability of the super Earth. So to summarize my talk, uh, hydrogen silicate reaction can produce water, converting a hydrogen rich version of the planet to a water rich planet. And mixing the mixing can result in compositional gradient in ice giants. And high pressure chemistry will play a key role in understanding the structure of ice giants. But I want to highlight that it itself wouldn't give you uh, uh, all the pictures uh, about how this, you know, low density large planets would evolve, because we really need to have a good case study of ice giants. And I hope that the um, the mission that are being discussed here can allow us to better understand understand the internal structure. And I would argue that that will impact a lot about our understanding about these exoplanets and potential conversion of those planets into super earth. And in some sense, habitability of some super earth. And also in uh, pure chemistry, you know, uh, Uranus and Neptune will provide natural uh, lab for us to understand high pressure hydrogen storage problems as well. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, people in my group, and I also like to thank the um, generous funding from funding agencies and CAT grant, and also Materials of the Universe um, initiative at ASU. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, feel free to put your claps in there. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for questions and discussion. And at the very end, um, Jody will put up our community note news. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so you talked a lot about the, the sub-Neptune to super-Earth possible conversion. Um, where does the... Um, where do the gas giants fit in there? Is, is the possible evolution of gas giants, does that turn into um, possible super earth or a potential different uh, combination of uh, materials? Yeah, I think that is a really exciting question. And, and, and I have to admit that I'm a I'm not a planet formation. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not in the um, planet formation community and I don't really do the, such a modeling, but uh, after seeing this type of reaction, what uh, intrigues me a lot is the fact that, you know, in this mass radius diagram, unfortunately, it is, this is truncated just above the um, uh, Neptune and Uranus. It doesn't show a large population of gas giants that exist uh, 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 way above, up there. Uh, but if you uh, uh, look at this, um, you know, trend in demographics. There's an interesting sort of tailing off and, and reduction of number of planets when you reach to the Uranus and Neptune. And this continues until you reach the Saturn. So there's a sub Saturn group that has much less populace than the um, uh, sub Neptunes. There are some suggestions and modelings that if you go into this regime, Hydrogen ingassing into the rocky portion becomes so efficient because pressure is much higher. Then you don't build much planets. It 
probably split into the sub-Neptune groups because if you don't build the hydrogen atmosphere, but you actually store into the interior, you will reduce the uh, radius. So you don't really populate this area as much. But on the other hand, if, you, if your planet can quickly accrete the hydrogen available around it very quickly, then it'll probably go to the gas giant's level. But certainly this is just a hypothesis without really putting things into the context of planet dynamics and formation dynamics and the numbers. But I think that's an interesting and important question to think about because, you know, gas giants, hydrogen chemistry would be also very important for the gas giants. But in this picture, what is interesting is that this reaction potentially have a some capability of linking all this low density planets from sub-Neptunes, ice giants, and the um, uh, gas giants, potentially. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have a question from Nadine. Uh, suppose a large hydrogen reservoir, what composition do you predict for the metal core after formation of uh, the water envelope? More uh, iron HX, or rather iron silicate, or else? That's an excellent question that I left out the slide. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we did some mass radius calculations. We actually modeled the planet form in between uh, uh, um, uh, end members. So uh, the slide shows the end member case, hydrogen rich version without water and um, a bare planet without any atmosphere left. And the um, complete, converse, uh, conver uh, complete conversion to the um, water. So this is a, a, a water uh, a rich uh, version of this originally hydrogen rich version. And in between, I'm showing the um, sort of like uh, intermediate version, potentially like our um, ice giants in our solar system. Um, what is interesting about this pathway in planet evolution is that silicon is get reduced and go into the metallic part. If metallic part is differentiated from silicate, then it'll actually grow the core or metallic core in size. And as depicted by this cartoon, you can see gradual increase in the size of the metallic part of the core. And you can at, at the same time um, see that the, um, it's getting sort of lighter gray, which represents concentration increase, uh, increase in concentration of silicon in the core. So you are increasing the size of the core, yet you are lowering the density of the metallic part of the core. What is interesting is that if you do complete conversion of this from earth ratio of the core, and the silicate mantle by hydrogen and converting it into the um, water version, the, the size of the core coincide the size ratio between metallic core and the silicate for the mercury, which is 77% or 80%, which is interesting. I'm not arguing that mercury formed uh, this way, or I'm not arguing that mercury was once water word. <laughs> But it's an interesting coincidence. And there is a documentation of supermercury out there in the exoplanet regime. So this is an interesting thing to think about. So let me stop there. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Um, I'm glad you mentioned mercury at the end. I've been thinking the whole time, um, mercury has a really large core. How does that fit into all of this? Um, we have a question from Krista Soderlund. Um, how exogenic versus endogenic are the reactions you're proposing? Um, so uh, that's ongoing project. We are running an experiment to address exogenic, endogenic uh, water uh, uh, balance for the um, uh, uh, chemical reaction. Uh, simply put, um, you can think of the, 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 the system behavior in terms of hydrogen versus water activity that you may remember uh, uh, your freshman chemistry. Um, so if you raise the um, oxygen activity or water activity into the system, that'll prevent silicon from 
uh, undergoing reduction by hydrogen. So uh, if you start producing a lot of H2O in the system endogenically way, or if you deliver water exogenic way into the system mixed with hydrogen, now you raise the um, activity of water. And what we are investigating now is where is that tipping point? The tipping point means that the tipping point uh, for water becomes or water activity becomes high enough to prevent or stop the reduction of silica. Then what would happen for this evolutionary picture based on chemical reaction is that you're not gonna convert hydrogen rich version all the way to the water rich version. You will actually stop it and then live with a uh, uh, internal configuration that might be pretty similar to, to what we believe it is the case for our ice giants where we have thick layer of water and hydrogen atmosphere with rocky core. So I believe that the, um, to understand our uh, ice giants, it is important to understand how this, you know, hydrogen and H2O chemical balance works for the system. I'm, I'm not sure I answer your question, but at least I can <laughs> uh, uh, hypothesize a few interesting things. But I think this is an interesting, exciting field to develop, to keep up with our knowledge building for Uranus and Neptune plus sub-Neptunes. So I want to emphasize uh, the important role of uh, high pressure chemistry experiment. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, I see one question in the chat. Um, let's go ahead and answer it real quick. But Jody, in the meantime, can you throw up the community news uh, sure. on the screen? Uh, so Artem asks, in order to make all the hydrogen from the envelope to react with the mantle to make water, hydrogen needs to be in contact with water. Does that mean that hydrogen and water must be partially or fully mixed in the envelope? Can Excellent answer that question. pretty quick? Yes, that's a, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a very important question. Number one, mixing and demixing is a key process to understand as the um, Artem um, mentioned there. And the second question is excess amount of hydrogen will dilute the system. In that case, you can still drive the, um, the reaction even if water forms. So there are a couple of factors that you can think about. Um, and there, there's a dynamics factor that could potentially play a very important role for the um, continuing hydrogen reaction. Thank you so much, Dr. Shim. Uh, I'll pass it off to Jody real quick and then we'll call it a day. Sure, yeah, and, and thanks so much, Dan. That was a really incredible, uh, really incredible talk. I loved it. Um, yeah, so as you all know, just in the last, I guess we're over by a minute. So if, if you're heading out, hopefully you, you caught those links, but in the last couple seconds, I'll just say, we like to have this community news slide so that folks can kind of stay close knit and, and sort of stay up to date on the happenings uh, of the Ice Giants community. And so um, there's a few links, you know, faculty positions, uh, postdoc opportunities, upcoming conferences, things like that. Uh, and the most important one that I'd like to highlight is uh, next month, June 13, we've got Dr. Dr. Matt Clement uh, from here at APL, um, and he'll be uh, he'll, he'll be talking about, um, I think, I believe it's modeling of, of uh, I think maybe the atmosphere, the interior, something like that of Uranus. I should have looked at the, the title, but click on that link and you will be able to find the title in the abstract um, and you can add the, uh, the Zoom link to your calendar as like a meeting invite. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that, that's all I'll say. Feel free to click on the links and thanks again, Dan, that was a really great talk. Um, and Mallory, if you have anything else to say, otherwise we can, uh, we can, we can call it and close this out. That's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good week. Thanks everyone.